Welcome to Job Sharing and Beyond, the future of work podcast that goes beyond the traditional nine to five. I am Karen Tischler, speaker, consultant, and host of the show, where we hear from global experts every other week to discover innovative solutions and tips on how to remain a relevant employer in the future. It is such an honor to welcome my guest today. Josh Lefts is an entrepreneur, former CNN and NPR journalist, and the leading global expert on modern fathers in the workplace. He's the author of the award-winning book, All In, how our work-first culture fails dads, families, and businesses, and how we can fix it together. The United Nations named him a global champion of gender equality. The Financial Times named him one of the world's top 10 male feminists. He recently participated in the UN Women's Empowerment Principles documentary, The Power of Partnerships for Achieving Gender Equality. In our conversation, we cover many different topics from father's caregiving, flexible work, transferable business skills from unpaid care work, COVID-19's impact and more. Welcome to the show, Josh. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming to the show. Now, Josh, we have listeners from all over the world listening to us. So I always ask my guests where they're calling in from and if there is a particular type of food or a site that would be really good looking at or trying out to eat when they are coming to the area where you are at. Oh, cool. So, well, I live in Atlanta um, in the, the southeastern U.S. And um, uh, there's so many wonderful things here. I love the city. I love living here. Uh, if you were going to pick one, we have the world's biggest aquarium. We have the Coca-Cola Museum. Uh, we have tours of all sorts of exciting things downtown. There's the CNN tour that a lot of people love to go on. Yeah. Um, and it's also just a beautiful city. It's very green and very lush. And I encourage everybody to come and visit. That would be lovely. And the CNN tour that I would love to do that. Yes. Yeah. I've done a lot of research about you. And the birth of your third child led to your current work focus and activism. Could you share with our listener what happened? Sure. So I was at that point, I was covering fatherhood on CNN. Um, I was doing all, all conversations with fellow dads and reporting facts uh, about fatherhood that, that people didn't know. And then when my wife was pregnant with our third child, with our daughter, um, we, we figured out that I would be needed at home for caregiving after she was born. Um, but the policies that I was under were ridiculous, uh, and yet they were, they were sadly typical. Under these policies, anyone could get 10 paid weeks after having a kid, except a biological father. Anyone except a dad in a traditional scenario could get 10 paid weeks to stay home and be with their kids. So I tried to change things internally. Um, I, I went to directly to benefits and I, I discussed it and they asked me to put it in writing and, and no change was made. I, I just kept being told that I would be told eventually what would happen. And then my daughter was born prematurely in an emergency. And uh, still, they wouldn't give me an answer about whether I got the 10 weeks. A guy like me could only get two weeks. So less than two weeks after she was born, um, I was messaging work saying, am I going to get these 10 weeks or not? And that's when they said, no, I could not have the time. So I launched legal action um, and that move created tons of, of attention and publicity and all these women's groups around the country and around the world were very, very supportive um, as were groups of dads and dad blogs and mom blogs and all these things. And it became uh, this well-known case uh, in America and around the world with all this news coverage. And so I started off on an exploration then to figure out what was it about our case, about my case that became so interesting? And I came to understand that the issue of men as equal caregivers is essential. And that until we start giving men equal opportunity to be caregivers, we will never have equal opportunity for women in the workplace. 
Thank you so much for sharing, Josh. And while I'm very sorry that you had to go through all of this, I am truly appreciative that y y your activism has created such a change and and really get so many things started. And now um, you then wrote the book all in. Could you share with our listeners a little bit more about your book? Sure. So when I started um, going on that exploration to figure out this whole, the importance of this whole issue around men and caregiving, um, Harper Collins gave me this opportunity to write a book about it. And um, so I started interviewing lots of people as part of this research and, and looking up facts. My background is I was a fact checker on CNN. And so I, I did something that almost no one in journalism does. And that is that I would go through not, not just what companies or organizations say that their surveys found, but I would actually look at the raw data and the methodologies. Mm -hmm. And so I started doing that for family issues. And I started um, just finding all of these facts about the many structures that are preventing men and women from having equal opportunities. Um, so in the book, I explore that and I came to understand that there are three major categories that are holding us back. It's the laws, policies, and stigmas. And everything that holds back women in the workplace holds back men at home. All of these same things that make it harder for women to achieve quality um, and, and parity in the workplace are also making it harder for men to get the opportunity to be equal caregivers. So my book explores how to fix that. In your book, as you were saying, in, you were tackling different um, aspects. So. Um, one was the flexibility stigma. And as I'm, you know, as the show is job sharing and beyond, I'm particularly interested on flexible work. And um, you mentioned that, like, for example, that seven in 10 workers say telecommuting is an important benefit when considering a new job. And 10% say they even would take a pay cut. And here we are with COVID, where all of a sudden overnight remote work has become the new normal for so many um, people. Now, um, I am curious to um, learn more about, like, you know, in the US and in your experience and also Canada, what you have learned besides um, remote work, um, like, you know, for example, in Europe recently, the company Zurich um, um, UK mentioned that they changed um, their job descriptions by adding th six words like part-time job share and flexible working options. And they saw that it attracted more than double the number of applicants across males and females for every role. And, and so I'm curious, have you seen also changes about that? Yes. Um, part of the fallacy of this in recent years has been, I see, I always tell people that the sexist structures of the workplace uh, come from two things. One is outright sexism, but the other is good intentions. And there are well-intentioned people who are actually making things worse because what they were doing is making flexible work and part-time and job sharing available to women only. Right. And their thinking was, well, women want this. Women... And what that did was it made it even harder in a lot of ways because only women could get that and men could not, which left families with no choice right. but for women to do more caregiving. Um, so the paradigm shift is to understand what, you know, the data that's in my book and I continue to report and people can read at my website, joshlebs.com. Men want these options as much as women do. In fact, there was a study by Ernst and Young um, that looked at men in the United States and found that men are even more likely than women to switch jobs or careers or take a pay cut or move to a different state or move out of the country in order to have more time with their families, even more likely than women. Now, um, that's a bit skewed because women are even more likely to drop out of the workforce altogether. Right. But among those of us who stay in it, men are looking for that even more than women. Um, but people didn't know that. So what we need to understand is that all of these things need to be gender neutral. Um, you know, after I filed my legal case, there's an, an organization, a government agency in the United States um, called the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And they sent out guidance to all businesses saying, for example, when it comes to leave, Women can get physical recovery leave after a birth, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But caregiving leave has to be 
established as its own separate thing, clearly distinguished, and that has to be gender neutral. And this, this idea that all of these options for work-life balance, work-life integration have to be gender neutral, that is a new concept to a lot of people. But if you're not making it available for men, then you're taking options away from women as well. So yes, I am seeing this move. Now, we can talk about what's gonna happen with COVID. I mean, COVID has thrown everything for a loop and unfortunately it could go in, in two directions. It could be an opportunity for businesses to discover that this is the new reality and that men and women need this, mm -hmm. but it also could backfire. That's one of my concerns is that some businesses might mistakenly think of what we're going through now as being equivalent to uh, what it's like to work from home. And it's not because right now we've got kids at home needing parents help and exactly. not the same level of productivity that it usually is to work from home. So if businesses are watching their employees now and saying, well, we're a little concerned about their productivity from home, it won't be like this someday when kids can go back to school. One of the silver linings I have seen is because what you just said, that it's so important that unpaid care work is both for men and for women. And that all of a sudden by having on like Zoom calls, both men and women having children running in the background, that it sort of more normalizes being at work as well as having a family. So, I, and um, in, like I've seen a recent um, study in Germany that um, more men are actually now actively asking for flexible work because of their um, caregiving needs. And I, I've done the research about you and you were saying that often that's something that men feel very uncomfortable about um, talking about at work. And you quoted people that had, I think there was one gentleman, they had, he had five children, but at work, nobody knew about him yep. even having a child, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, I, I run into that all the time. Um, you know, your listeners should know this. So it's not just about asking, it's also that men have been punished. So a lot of what I explore in my book, men have been fired or demoted or lost job opportunities for taking paternity leave or seeking a flexible schedule um, because of, of bosses, managers who believe that caregiving is really women's work and because uh, people have a false impression of what dads are like at home. So they believe these old stereotypes that dads are lazy and do nothing and hang out all day. Um, and so they think if a man's taking paternity leave, he's really just going home to do nothing. Um, so they punish him. And so, you know, when you've had a child, the last thing you can do is risk losing your job or losing a promotion. So families get scared and men don't, don't ask for flexibility. Men don't ask for teleworking opportunities. They don't ask for paternity leave. And so that's why the biggest problem of all is the stigmas. And that's true about flexibility as well. You were talking about the flexibility stigma. And that applies to everyone. Women face this as well. Um, and, and men do face this often even worse. And so we need to get past these old ideas of what men and women are like at home so that we can fix this in the workplace. Now, you have done a recent TEDx talk exactly about that, where you are trying to remove the man can't myth. And um, could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah. So I have this talk up at TED.com. You can see it on my website at uh, joshlevs.com um, from TEDx Centennial Park Women. And it, it is uh, about the realities of men and how different they are from the stereotypes of men. Um, so, you know, the overall, I, I work with this uh, brand called Dove Men Plus Care, and we do a bunch of research. And our research continuously shows the overwhelming majority of men say that um, being caring is the most important or one of the most important factors that there is, that friendships are about caring, that being a loving father is the most important thing to them. Um, so these old ideas that men aren't caring and men aren't loving, are just statistically false. And unfortunately, some men uh, continue that stereotype when they think they're helping. You know, like they'll show up at events and they'll say, I'm special, I'm different, I'm not toxic. I like to 
you know, speak openly about loving my family. Well, that's not exceptional. That's not unusual. <laughs> um, normalize it. We need to help everyone understand that that is what men are like and that most men are not in any way, um, you know, taking part in those old toxic ideas. There obviously are men who are like that and we need to weed them out and make clear that that's not okay. Um, but the, the statistics, the real data, show the overwhelming majority of men are part of this new era of, of modern masculinity. So um, changing that paradigm is essential if we're going to, uh, to fix these problems so that people in power everywhere in government and business understand that men really are about caring and need the time to be caregivers. You talk in your book about advertising, and I remember the picture of the famous Swedish wrestler who's holding his young baby to really try to shift a paradigm that men indeed are caregivers. So I'm wondering, as we are talking about the flexibility stigma, could there be a way to maybe advertise more like whether that is job sharing or flexible work in a way to make people better understand that what you said it isn't that you know a dad is sitting at home and waiting um you know for his wife to come back but can actually do more care work Oh, of course um look there are people that i've interviewed who think that the biggest source of this problems is television advertising. <laughs> no, and for a lot, and, and in the Dove Men Plus Care survey we did, we found across several countries, um, women are even more concerned about this than men are. I mean, large numbers of men and women, very large numbers across all these countries surveyed, said that the, the images of men in media bother them. Um, but often women are even more bothered by these, uh, these images of men as being um, incapable, these buffoons who aren't caregiving. You know, first of all, they say, that's just not what my husband is like. He's equal with me, uh, uh, equally capable. Um, but they also understand that the image makes a difference. It implants these old ideas in people's minds. And what I explore in the book and in my, my work is that this whole idea of men as lazy and incapable at home is actually, an extension of uh, a form of bigotry against women because it comes from the idea that women are all those same things in the workplace. That's where it comes from. It comes from this idea that, you know, ha ha ha, a woman wants to be a CEO or a president or a lawyer or an astronaut. You know, women can't do that. Women are lazy in the workplace, all these old ideas. And it's just the exact same thing. Say, say that about men at home. Um, and because of misreadings of data, some people think that men are like that. And this is why I correct the facts all the time. There's a section of my website called Dad Facts, where I lay out the time use surveys and what's really going on with men and women and how men and women are, are putting in equal hours on behalf of our families. Um, there's three forms of work. It's paid work, unpaid work, and child care. And when you put those three together, we're putting in equal hours. The difference is that men are putting in more of those hours and paid work. Women are putting in more of those hours at home. And that is an extension of this problem that I'm talking about, these old ideas um, about men and women that we need to fix. And I'm really, really appreciative that you are going around the world and changing these myths and explaining to people what it really is. Because I, I feel very, very strongly that um, it needs to be equal between men and women and pay care work as well as flexible work because otherwise we end up if if quote unquote only women are doing say job sharing then it's a mommy track and it then it really doesn't help and um right. so um now as you had mentioned like you know from a skill set um it seems like when you look at the world economic forum like the latest future of jobs report, for example, from October 2020, it includes as the top 15 skills, a lot of soft skills that also can be learned during caregiving and parenting. And But still, I feel a lot of the business leaders undervalue these transferable business skills that can be really honed in um, during parenting, whether that is during, you know, a time of unpaid care work or in general. So, yeah, so let me explain why that happens. You're absolutely right. So what I found repeatedly 
is that um, businesses still have this old idea uh, of what a terrific, hardworking, successful employee looks like. And they believe it's someone who sits at their desk the most, who is always there, who is always available around the clock. Um, and the problem with that is that they're not actually measuring results. They're just measuring how long someone works. I have a column I wrote about this for a publication called Strategy in Business. So you right. Can see it. So, the, you know, and, and the things I, I, I get where it comes from. I mean, it's not just people with old ideas. I mean, I've done work in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. I've gone into companies and I've had people say to me, oh, that guy's such a good employee. He's here until midnight all the time. And then right. back at 7 a.m. And I'm always thinking, no, that doesn't make him a good employee. What's surprising is if you set aside how long someone's working and you instead look, what did they get done? What did they achieve last year or over a quarter, over a month, any metric you want? You very rarely find this the same people. Very rarely are the people putting in the most hours also the people who are most productive. So we need to rid ourselves of these ideas that a good employee looks like someone who's always at their desk um, and start to understand that if you, if you literally just look at the most important thing, work output, you often find that it's uh, people who have caregiving responsibilities as well in their lives, not just for kids, but for their elderly parents or a sick spouse or anyone. Um, they learn how to be very good multitaskers <laughs> and it keeps them in touch with reality and with right. humanity and with empathy, all of these things which are increasingly essential because little by little machinery is taking over more of the road jobs, more of the physical right. mechanics. And the, the uniquely human jobs are increasingly the ones in what you refer to as soft skills, what this woman I work with, Kelly Palmer, she calls them um, the new power skills. They are things like creativity, uh, and empathy and emotional intelligence and giving feedback, all of these things that are still uniquely human. And it's very rarely the people sitting at their desk the most who have those skills um, in the most copious amount. It could be, but it's rare. So we need to do the smartest, simplest thing, which is to start looking at actual work output instead of numbers of hours being available at your desk or, or you know, at your home desk right now. Um, and when businesses do that, then they rid themselves of these old stigmas and they start to see the power and potential of, of workers who have these skills. I saw that Unilever in New Zealand is actually starting a pilot on a four day week program. And I just thought that was awesome because that really is all about productivity because it's leaning heavily on the four day week concept where um, you basically have um, the same amount of productivity, but instead of working like five days a week um, of eight hours, let's say you're working four days with eight hours. I see what you're saying. Yeah, <clears throat> no, that totally makes sense. And I'm not surprised it would be Unilever, you know, yeah. I mentioned N Plus Care and they're part of that company. <laughs> I've been to their headquarters a lot. Um, they are one of the forward thinking companies that's helping advance, um, you know, things, these issues all over the world. Yeah. And Alan Job is one of my favorite CEOs because, for example, in Germany, there is at least one set of VPs at Unilever that actually has been job sharing for um, many years and they've been promoted together and they've even created a um an acronym of the uh, the initials of their first and last names together and that's their email name and um oh, it, cool. yeah and in canada um one of the vice presidents is actually somebody who was a stay-at-home mom for a you know a number of years and then went back and um, continued to um, climb up the ladder so yes i definitely see them as a, um, you know, best practice example of what one um, could be doing to really help uh, move forward with gender equality. Yeah. Right. In the next five years, what do you think needs to happen to really get us closer to gender equality? So, uh, you know, this is why I do this work. If we don't fix this in this generation, then someday when our kids, when my kids grow up, they'll have the same fight. Exactly. Yeah. It takes, um, it takes a fearlessness and it takes more people um, tackling both halves of this issue. And, you know, the half that I focus on 
um, was getting virtually no attention. All these issues that prevent men from having equal opportunity to be caregivers. And so we need to tackle both halves of this. Um, we need to fix the laws, we need to fix the policies, and we need to most of all tackle the stigmas. And it will take individuals speaking out more and more, and it will take more men speaking out. Um, every time something is done to prevent them, to um, stigmatize them, to damage them, if they do the work of being an equal caregiver, uh, we're going to have to, they need to speak out and they need to exercise their rights. And now not everyone's going to you know, launch legal action like I did. Um, and I should say Time Warner ended up revolutionizing its policy, making it much, much better for men and women. So I know that um, things can change. I know that change can be accomplished. And there are increasingly men who are taking legal action when necessary. Um, but we also need to normalize the images of men as equal caregivers. We need to get to the point where it's not exciting or exceptional to see a dad, um, whether you know it's in fiction or nonfiction, in the media caring for his children. It should. We need to get to the point where it's just as natural to see that as it is to see a mom. Um, and that's how we know that we will, you know, be making a difference. And and in the really big picture, I, I tell people this all the time: whether you're going to have kids or not, it, it's not really about that. The, the way to build gender equality, the number one way is to raise kids seeing it because they see the difference between uh, what reality is and what they're told. And when kids grow up seeing that mom and dad have equal opportunity to make their own choices and maybe mom wants to stay home, maybe dad wants to stay home, like that it's about having a choice that's yours. Um, that is the most powerful thing that can be done in the long term. And all the research, including longitudinal studies, shows that making sure that from the moment a child is born, a man has substantial paternity leave, that makes a big difference. Because when a man gets that at the beginning of a child's life and creates more parity at home, the man becomes as confident and comfortable doing all the child care things. And the longitudinal studies show that across the 18 years as that kid grows up, there's more parity at home. So the kids see it in practice. Um, in the long run, the more we do that, the more the change will inevitably follow from the culture. As I'm listening to you, one of the thoughts I had, you have the day, take your son, daughter to work day. And one day I was hoping maybe we could also do take your manager to unpaid care work. Just That's such a good idea. <laughs> oh man, when, you need to do that. Okay, let's have to make that happen that is so good <laughs> yeah that i would love i mean i really would love this because i think it would change the mindset that it is work and it is you know it's rewarding it's exhausting and it isn't quote unquote just babysitting right yeah so <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah dads are not babysitters that's another exactly. thing. when you take care of your kid you're not babysitting <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, you know, we need to address the fear of men as well. I mean, it still happens. All these guys have these stories of they, they are at home and they take their kid to the playground and the women stare at them like, what are you doing here? You're a man. You shouldn't be here. And it makes them uncomfortable because of how they were raised to think of men. Um, you know, we need to, to address all these things. But take your manager to unpaid work day. That is the greatest concept. I just think that is sheer brilliance. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank <Wow>. you. Yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, to be honest, I was a stay-at-home mom, right, for 11 years. And it wasn't necessarily something I had ever anticipated. And I sometimes felt, you know, there was a day where I'd be like, what did I actually do? Like, it was hard to explain because nothing from a physical perspective seemed any different. And I was still exhausted. And so I felt if everybody you know, could experience that. And, and then the other thing I also feel very strongly is like, you know, to start early on, like, for example, I, I'm German. So in Germany, there is this organization that created a, um, a picture book to reduce stereotypes where you would have a male caregiver and a female firefighter, for example. And then the other thing is talking at universities or even high schools about unpaid care work and explaining what it really is. And um, because I just sort of feel people have that wrong stereotype image. And so the more we actually talk 
early on as well, it can really make a difference. Yeah. Oh, I'm with you. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that. Like, I try to keep an eye out for this all the time, but once in a while, there's something even I don't notice. And I remember a few years ago, we were on a plane and um, the pilot was making an announcement and my daughter asked if women can be pilots. And that's when I, like, she was like, wow. Four. And that's when I realized that we had never had one. You know, she'd flown a lot, we fly a lot. And, and she hasn't had, and I said, yes, absolutely. So then I like, you know, became determined we're gonna find a way to get her on, a, and now we're not flying, but we're gonna find a way to get her on a plane with a woman pilot, because I want her to not just know conceptually, but to know factually that yes, it really is done. It really does happen, it really is an option. Because I want her to know she has every option. And it, you know, as you especially mentioned this with a, a female pilot, there was an um, uh, experiment done in, in, I've seen it in Switzerland as well as in the UK, where they ask children, young children, to draw like a fighter pilot, I think a fire fighter, and I think it was a surgeon. And then they were supposed to name these professionals. And the majority of them were naming them, say, male. And then what they said, oh, we have some visitors today. And so they brought in a surgeon, a, fire, a fighter, and a, um, a fighter pilot, and they were all female. And it was very surprising to all the children to see that. So, so yeah, that's good. why I like these ideas to, you know, have things early on to give children already a perspective like your daughter, right? That everything is really possible, both directions, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the difference between being told it and experiencing it in practice is huge. Right. You know? um, it, it does leave imprints, and, and it goes both ways, by the way. I mean, I oh, watch- Oh, absolutely. Like, like my boys, and like I watch it, look, my boys are still growing up in society too, and, and even though most men are caregiving and they're uh, caring and good and they're surrounded by them, there are guys who, you know, profess, I mean, look, we've got one in the White House who, like, you know, are- <laughs> Well, I don't know when this is going to air, but we're taping this in, in late 2020, so he's still there. Um, and, uh, you know, who, who is just a completely psycho, wacko human being, but also, as part of that, um, professes this incredibly backward, clueless version of masculinity. So it is still out there, and you can find it in various places, and, um, you know, they will still be affected by that. And so... I want to strengthen them to understand how to respond to that and to recognize that kind of toxicity when they see it and to reject it. Yeah. And they will. They're, they're, you know, they're good people. They're, they're like most men. They're good people. I mean, they're still kids. And I just want to make sure that, you know, things don't get even worse. Yeah. No, no, I absolutely agree. My husband is a better cook than I am. And my boys, oh. they both are very good at baking as well as cooking. So, you know, sometimes if I'm really lucky, at night, I, you know, I come and they've prepared some new dish for me, so. Oh, I, nice. Wow, yeah. you are lucky. <laughs> you are lucky. Wow. So, you know, Josh, I could talk with you forever, but I know we're coming to an end of our time. So I just wanted to make sure that we have really covered everything that you wanted to share with our listeners today. Yes. Um, no, I think it's a great conversation. I, I really want to do something with your whole take your boss to unpick your I'm going to talk about this off, offline afterwards because I want to write about it. It's just so okay. Um, everyone who is listening is required to go on LinkedIn and connect with me. I'm the only Josh Lebs in the world, L-E-V-S, and you can learn more at my website. And I love to hear people's questions and ideas. And, you know, sometimes people reach out to me with their challenges about what they are going through in the workplace. And I do my best to or in their life. And I do my best to help them as well. You know, there, there is a community of us, um, of men and women who are deeply committed to fixing these problems. And um, we recognize that it, it really does take all of us in order to do that. So, um, you know, if you find yourself in a situation, you or your husband or, you know, anyone you love is in a situation in which uh, you're, you're facing some of these stigmas or stereotypes and they're causing problems for you, get in touch and, and we'll do our best to guide you through it and give you the tools you need to uh, get to the other side. Well, thank you so much for all your insights, Josh. It was wonderful having you on the show today. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the show. 
We hope you gained valuable insights and new ideas. To keep listening to future episodes, please head over to iTunes or your favorite player and subscribe and give it a rating. We would very much appreciate a review and for you to share it on social media so more people can start innovating in how they offer employment. Until the next time, goodbye.